Essentially, the big news that we announced is that two part. One is the testnet. So the Silkworm testnet that we've been working on for a few months is ready to launch. Uh, and that brings about much improved performance to the EVM, basically compared to the current testnet version and its Silkworm integration. What that means, essentially just high level, better, faster, easier, and at the forefront of EVM compatibility. So that's a big one. And as the testnet will be released, there's still no formal date, but I can share that we would be running the testnet for a period of about a month and a half or so until we launch on the mainnet. So the idea would be, barring any unforeseen issues, that we would be launching on mainnet maybe mid-March or something like that, mid to end March. That's the general idea. So that's when EVM would launch. And then the second part, which is really what got people, I think, excited is that we will be, or the EVM essentially will be a public good and it'll be launching with the EOS token. So we had talked about when we talked about a long time ago that we were going to be launching with a standalone token that would be launched. Essentially, there'd be a token sale, et cetera, that there'd be airdrops to token holders. For a variety of reasons, essentially, we've decided to do with the EOS token instead. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much the big news. I don't know if Zach wants to add anything onto that, but essentially the user experience will be much smoother. The functionality will be more performant and it really will ensure that the value remains within EOS. So today you've dropped this Twitter thread. We wanted to talk about it on the Fireside Chat because there's a lot of details that we aren't really going to be published anywhere. It's more conversational, but this is a huge win just from my personal experience uh, working with the project. When the concept of a separate token first came up, I was just like a lot of the people in the community. The first reaction is, why would you even want another token? Let's just use EOS. And I was in that same boat initially. And then when you really start digging into the details and everything, there were a lot of reasons for its own token. So one external capital, which we have ENV now that kind of serves a bigger purpose, but then there were other things of uh, the ecosystem itself and the token economy that was planned. So for example, RPC nodes, the initial, the initial idea was to, and I've explained it like this before was to, is doing something that was never done before. So it was essentially merging an EVM with a decentralized version of Infura, whereby there would be incentives for read actions, which has never been done before. And that was something quite innovative. And the only way to really make that happen was through some means of incentivization. So the best approach would have been the EVM token. Also for ecosystem grants, it would have its own percentage for that. But there was always this pushback from the community. And like I said, I had my own initial pushback on it initially. And I am so happy that we made the decision. We listened to the community. We listened to the market. We listened to the engineers. So like, obviously we're in January, we expected the product to launch in the fall and that didn't happen as everyone knows. A big part of that was added complexities. Part of it was token economy, but part of it was also complexities of putting extra horsepower into this EVM. So the Soakworm implementation, as much as it delayed things a little bit, it is by far going to allow the EOS EVM. Now, I guess this is the other really important thing is we are going to be retiring the trust EVM name. You'll start seeing the different chats and social handles changing their names over the next like week or so. EOS EVM is the name of the EVM moving forward, or just simply EVM if you're talking internally within the community. But with the Silkworm implementation, Silkworm is the only version of Ethereum that's actually built from the ground up in C+. As everyone knows, Antelope is also based on C+. You write smart contracts in C+, for Antelope chains, so it's already the fastest, but then it also has the compatibility there. But the other component to it, so I started digging into the original idea for your token economy, and it would require a supply of tokens for incentives for the RPCs, because the original idea was to have a robust ecosystem with at least 21 or more decentralized RPC nodes that would be bootstrapping the network. And more than 90% of Ethereum transactions are pushed through Infura nodes. The market kind of showcased that they don't really care to use a different RPC node. Once you set up your MetaMask and you point it to an RPC node, it's very rare as an end user that you ever change that unless you're jumping between Polygon, BSC, or Ethereum. So with this move, we are removing the decentralized Infura component. The ENF will run an RPC node to guarantee uptime of the network, but anyone will be able to run an RPC node. So the general idea of subsidizing node operations was that you would need 
like hundreds of millions of transactions to generate enough fees for it to be a viable business model to run an RPC node. That was one of the problems we were actually trying to solve with the original token economy. And that's the reason why in Ethereum, 90% of the transactions are going through Infura because Infura is backed by consensus, early adopters of Ethereum. It's in their best interest to just run the infrastructure as they essentially run it as a public good. Unless you're doing an incredible amount of transaction volume, which means your project is probably profitable in itself, nobody's really paying for those RPC endpoints. It's all subsidized by Infura themselves. So the ENF will be offering that same service. Essentially, we will be running the RPC to make sure that there's uptime. And every time you, a user pays for gas, you're basically paying for the underlying resources on the native EOS layer. But then you're also paying for a little bit of RAM because the history of the EVM basically is stored in RAM. But then there's also a small profit margin there. And that profit margin is to allow other viable businesses to be created out of this if they wanted to run RPC nodes. And if there was enough adoption on the EVM where there's enough transactions where it'd be viable to do it as a business because there could be a profit model there. But with the ENF RPC node, the idea, and we're still working on the parameters here, but any profit margin on resource costs will either be locked up with no like usage plans, or what I would prefer is a token burn. So it's essentially adding a burning mechanism to EOS. If we go that direction, I believe that we probably will. And that'll be decided prior to mainnet launch happening in 10 to 12 weeks. So it'll add new mechanics to the EOS token. The EOS token hasn't really gained new utility since it was launched. The utility is trying to change with power up, but very much similar to when we announced the idea behind the ENV. And the ENV has this concept of, okay, whenever profit is able to be taken on an investment, those profits from the LP owned by the network, which is the fund with the 68 million EOS, any profits would be used to potentially do some mechanism. So very much in the same vein as what I'm saying here, it's possible to buy back and lock, buy back and burn. And that, that was the mechanism behind ENV. And that's still, I guess, up for discussion and up for an official decision, which is why I'm being careful with my words here, because none of these decisions have been made. I'm just saying what my preference is. My preference is always to burn, but other decision makers and legal and regulation, all, everything needs to be factored in for all of this. So I'm not saying that the burn is 100%, but it is what I would personally prefer. So as part of the RPC node operations, there's a profit being taken on every transaction. And the general idea is that profit could be used to either lock it up or burn it. And it'll be deflationary for the EOS token, add new utility for the EOS token, because now it serves as, as gas on the EVM side. So it'll allow people to transact using their MetaMask wallets, paying a small gas fee for every transaction, which is what most people in Web3 are used to from other chains. But then an additional value add that we're going to be launching with the mainnet launch is going to remove the friction of account creation, essentially, or ownership of your EOS tokens when you buy them on a centralized exchange. So let's say you just hear about EOS and you buy some EOS on Binance. Uh, if you have your tokens on Binance and you want to actually self-custody those tokens, you need to jump through all of the hoops that we still have as part of our ecosystem, like we're working on it. But... You have to create the EOS account. There's friction there. We know there's friction there. Uh, you have to pay for it. Paying for an account is not something that is the norm w within the rest of the Web3 space. And it always makes it difficult for onboarding new users, even though there's other advantages to the account systems, like the robust the permission sets and all of that. Um, but what th this new contract will allow would be, it would be deployed as a system contract on EOS and it would essentially act as a bridge between the EOS native side and the EOS EVM side. So whenever you're withdrawing your tokens from Binance, rather than having to create your own account as typical today, you would be able to send your tokens to a specific address on EOS, which would be the bridging contract, so to speak. And then in the memo field, you would put your public key that you would use for an Ethereum address. And by doing so, you'd be sending your tokens to the smart contract on EOS, and it would essentially just be automatically bridging it over to the EVM completely removing the necessity of creating a native EOS account to self-custody your tokens on the EOS EVM side of things. So that's going to be a huge advantage for onboarding new people into EOS. Um, they're not fully onboarded into native EOS, but they're definitely one step closer. 
And then there's different layers that over time we'll be able to build on top of this. And when I say we in a community through bounties, RFPs, or direct grants that are applied for, there's a lot of tooling that could be built on these technologies. So for example, a front end with a smart contract behind it, where if you have EOS tokens on the EVM side, that through a very simple UI, you can create an account because one of the points of friction for creating an account is you have to have EOS to actually create the account in the first place. And if you don't have an EOS account in the first place, you don't have EOS on chain. So the, uh, one of the things I would like to see a grant application for, so any, anyone listening to this, I would love to see a direct grant for it, would be the ability to create a full native EOS account using the EOS on the EVM side to make it as simple as possible to be able to take end users from the next level. The EOS EVM is going to significantly reduce the friction of getting a token holder from an exchange on chain, but then to get them from the EVM side of on chain to the native EOS side on, there's still some work to be done there. And that's not part of the scope of what we'll be launching in March. This is something that would be likely come later and most likely ideally from the community side. So just throwing that out there, but those are the core functionalities that I'm excited for. EOS has gas, added utility, a potential burn mechanism, and the ability to remove friction for creating full native EOS accounts.